welcome everyone. I'm Peg McFedrin. I'm a yoga teacher and yoga therapist. I practice and teach and mentor in the Phoenix Rising Method, which encourages clients to tune into their inner wisdom using embodied presence and self-inquiry as a means of creating transformation. When I first became aware of these spiritual philosophies about 15 years ago through mind-body practices such as yoga, I was still working as a high school teacher, grounded in my undergraduate studies in science and really not ready to take this on faith. I asked, where is the scientific basis to what I now knew deep down in my inner wise self to be true? This made it difficult for me to talk about and share my experiences. How things have changed in those 15 years. First, of course, was my own deep dive into the study of yoga and yoga therapy. And with the advent of neuroplasticity, the old static brain theories that I grew up with have been blown out of the water and made these discussions so much easier, especially with those like me who needed to see and understand the physical proof. My talk will be on neuroplasticity and embodied practices, how the emerging science of the brain goes a long way to explain the benefits of yogic practices. Embodied practices are now known to have a grounding in the new understanding of the brain called neuroplasticity, which is your brain's capacity to continue to change and grow both new brain cells and the neural networks connecting them throughout your life. Mindfulness and embodied practices are now shown through research to have a positive impact on the structure and function of our brains. I will be presenting information to enable you to develop an understanding of both the science of neuroplasticity as well as experiencing firsthand the benefits in your own mind and body. Let's look first at the mammalian nervous system. This consists of two main parts, the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system. The sensory neurons take information from your senses to your brain, and the motor pathways tell your, tell your body, tell your muscles, for example, how to operate. And these are messages that come from your brain to the periphery. The voluntary or somatic system are your muscles. Perhaps you're engaging them to run down the block. Whereas your autonomic nervous system consists of two parts, sympathetic and parasympathetic, and often these two parts are engaged unconsciously. We don't even have to think about them. And these are the two main parts that we're going to be concerned with today. So the autonomic nervous system is what is responsible for functions usually not consciously directed, such as breathing, heartbeat, digestion. It's pictured as a two-part antagonistic system when the sympathetic aspect is activated, the parasympathetic is not. When we can turn on the parasympathetic calming, there is less activation of the sympathetic. So the two, as I say, are antagonistic. Often in our, in our fast-paced world these days, the sympathetic system, the fight or flight, is turned on a lot more, and we have to really make an effort to turn that off by turning on the parasympathetic, the calming part, to rest, digest, and restore. And one of the benefits of restorative yoga is to turn off the sympathetic system and turn on the parasympathetic. A new theory called polyvagal theory identifies a third type of nervous system response that Stephen Porges calls the social engagement system, a playful mixture of activation and calming that operates out of a unique nerve influence, the vagus nerve. Rather than being in balance then, the three systems act sequentially to perceived threats. And so we still have the sympathetic, which mobilizes us to fight or flight. Within the parasympathetic, then, we have the dorsal vagal and also the ventral vagal. And these each have a different role and occur in different areas of the body. The division point, then, is the diaphragm, which is a thin muscle found in the chest cavity that separates our belly from the upper chest. The ventral vagal is found above the diaphragm and controls organs and systems in this area, including facial muscle, muscles as well as the heart and lungs. The dorsal vagal is found below the diaphragm and controls the organs in this area. So the dorsal vagal nerve below the diaphragm, this is the oldest system. It's found in both reptiles and mammals and reflects the need for survival. This nerve is non-myelinated, that means it lacks the myelinated covering 
for both protection and to increase the speed of nerve transmission. And this is the area that is responsible for a mobilization, feigning death. And we're all probably familiar with pictures of animals where the prey has been cornered by, uh, by their, by their, their uh, you know, the fox has cornered the gopher and the, the gopher is standing upright just uh, waiting to be devoured. So it's immobilized, it's feigning death, uh, usually to no avail. The ventral vagal nerve then is what is above the diaphragm. This was developed in mammals out of a need to nurture their young. This is more evolved than the dorsal one. It is myelinated for protection. It is linked to the cranial nerves that control facial expressions, smiling, frowning, laughing, and so on. And so this it goes a long way to, uh, to increase social engagement. But we must be in a safe environment for this aspect to be activated. As Stephen Porges says, when we are challenged, we start moving down that evolutionary ladder, and in evolutionary stages, we move from this safety engagement with the face and with the myelinated vagus, and we move to a more defensive system of the sympathetic nervous system, and then even lower to the dorsal vagus. And so the level of perceived safety, if it's high, we can, we can have social engagement, we can turn on our rest and restore, but if we start to have worry or anxiety, we're gonna mobilize the fight or flight, and if we have even lower safety, we come right down to, to, uh, to safety and security, and we might even engage immobilization and shut down. So how do we activate the vagal ventral nervous system? Well, we have to create a safe environment. Things such as making eye contact, using pleasant facial expressions, a soothing human voice. Think of a mother uh, cooing to her child, singing to her child. Familiar people and surroundings, we develop relationships. All of these will activate the ventral vagal system. Let's look now at the anatomy of the brain. Different areas of the brain developed, and we've already seen this in the development of the nervous system. Different areas of the brain developed over different evolutionary eras as animals and the needs of their brains became more complex. So initially we have the brain stem, the oldest system sometimes referred to as the reptilian brain. And we all have it, we're not reptiles, but we all still have it. Then we develop the limbic system, this is common in all mammals. And then primates in particular developed a more complex neocortex. This is the thinking brain, this is the reasoning brain, this is the analytical brain. And so we see uh, down here the brain stem, the oldest part, the areas here. And then within the brain, we see the limbic system. You might have heard of the amygdala, responsible for emotions, the hippocampus. And then around the limbic system developed the neocortex. So that's over here, again, on the left-hand side. And so how did these different areas evolve? So once again, the reptilian was the first. This is the unmyelinated vagus nerve, responsible for immobilization or shutdown, often uh, triggers depression, perhaps uh, post-traumatic stress. Then the mammalian brain, the, mammal, the one that mammals develop, the limbic system. And this is where we have located the sympathetic nervous system, again, responsible for responsible for mobilization, when we have anxiety or panic, we have fight or flight. And then the primates developed the, the neocortex, this is where the, this is connected with the myelinated vagus, this is where we have social engagement, emotional regulation, neuroprotection. And so we can train each of these areas of the brain. If we look first of all at the primate neo neocortex, the focus is role engagement, and we can engage here in mindfulness training. And this, one of the benefits is presence, being present to, to ourselves, to what our experience is right here, right now, being present. The mammalian or the limbic system, the focus is social interaction, compassion training, uh, resonance with other people. So having self-compassion for one's own experience, and this allows you then to have compassion for others and their experiences. And finally, the reptilian, the brainstem, the focus here is in body practice, and this develops resilience. So what is mindfulness? Well, essentially, it's directing your attention to your experience right here, right now, in this present moment. And this can be assisted by being aware of the breath 
and the body and doing one's best to allow any other distractions to just float away. Notice and become aware of what's happening right now without judgment or any attachment. And mindfulness studies have shown that this practice can increase prefrontal activation, thereby increasing attention and working memory, enhance prefrontal mood regulation, decrease stress and amygdala volume. The, the amygdala, remember, is responsible for emotion. So if we can decrease the volume of the amygdala, we'll have uh, less uh, erratic emotional responses, and also increase gray matter and the thickness or activation in certain areas of the brain. Compassion training then, we start with awareness or mindfulness of what's ailing us or what we're experiencing in the here and now. And then we accept any suffering or any condition as human without shame or blame. We can investigate this suffering to reveal root causes and conditions. And we can gradually widen our circle of care to mentors, to friends, to strangers, to critics. And one way of doing this is something called the loving kindness meditation, where we send love and well-being and so on to ourself, to others, to strangers, to all living beings, and even to Mother Earth. The benefits of compassion training, again, this is within the limbic system. Uh, other related emotion, positive feelings such as love, good health and well-being, approach and pro-social -so motivation. In body practices then, uh, for example, role modeling imagery helps us envision our ideal self and life. We can then start with admiring other people's way of being and then revise our own self-image and story to an ideal vision and narrative. We then energize our vision with heroic posture and breathe, such as yoga. And lastly, we fire and wire our vision with breath-induced flow. So wiring and firing our neurons together will help encourage this uh, embody embodiment. And one example of an embodied practice is Phoenix Rising Yoga Therapy. One of the foundations of it is that it is a way of easily supporting and facilitating a process by which those receiving it can embrace present-centered awareness using their body as opposed to their mind and that by doing so they will move more towards or even into direct experience. That is using movement, awareness of body and breath, and a focus on noticing whatever comes up in the present moment and realizing that we can trust that experience to be real, even without a full understanding of how and why it occurs. One neuroscience researcher who has been studying present moment awareness is Norm Farb at the University of Toronto. He looked at MRI results showing the location of firing of neurons before and after an eight-week mindfulness meditation program, noting that different areas of the brain will fire depending on whether the person is focusing on the past, the present, or the future. And here's what he found. He found that most people spend a lot of their time focusing on their remembered past. So they are, and you'll notice that uh, we have in the center here with this red circle, we have the present moment. And so most of the, the attention is on the immediate past, and then it proceeds into the, the further distant past with fewer, uh, fewer attention there. Um, but most of, our, most of our attention is on the remembered past. Or, and these are not quite as, as bright, they're a little bit grayed out because it hasn't happened yet, or we're imagining the future. So we're spending a lot of time with our focus on the immediate future. We're concerned, maybe we're worried, we're wondering what's going to happen. And so that's where we spend our time with less and less time in the more distant future as opposed to having our focus on the present moment. So very few, um, very few times remembered or experienced here, what's happening to me right here, right now in this body. And so again, what he has found is that most people are either in the past or in the future, not in the present. However, with, uh, with uh, mindfulness training, there appears, to be, um, there appears to be 
use of moment, momentary bodily sensation as an anchor to focus attention on the present. So people who went through that eight week training program were able to spend more time in the present moment. And awareness of changing body sensation may be especially important when responding to problems that are created or perpetuated through negative thinking. So how, what practice, practices can we use to stimulate the vagus nerve? Many that we find in yoga classes, depending on the style of yoga that you practice. One practice is chanting, and these are vocal active activities that produce a vibration in the neck, which stimulates the vagus nerve, nerve in a beneficial way. For example, chanting OM. Another is pranayama breath work, such as deep diaphragmatic breathing, where you breathe in through your nose, you inhale deeply into your belly, and you exhale very slowly. And controlling your exhale so that it lasts longer than the inhale helps turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. Movement of the diaphragm during this breath cycle massages the vagus nerve, and during the exhale, the diaphragm releases around the vagal nerve, improving its function. Meditation, all types of meditation are good for the vagus nerve. For example, compassionate or loving kindness meditation. Rather than letting your mind wander, you direct your good thoughts to other people and to yourself and to Mother Earth as well. Saying things like, may all beings be happy, healthy, loved, and safe. As positive emotions increase, so does your vagal tone. Yoga itself incorporates breath work, chanting, stress, stress reduction, all of which stimulates the vagus nerve and activate the parasympathetic, ner parasympathetic nervous system. And here's a picture of two of my yoga students in a restorative yoga class. Julian Walker has said, as well as other people have also said, neurons that fire and wire preferentially and maximally with regard to whatever is in the field of focused attention. This tells us that whatever we spend time and focus on, what we shine the light on, will determine the strength of that neural network. For people wanting to make transformative change, this means pulling our attention away from what no longer serves and accentuating the positive. And to do this, mindfulness or related contemplative training is vital for improving therapeutic outcomes and the changes are physical. There are MRI findings or other hard evidence showing that skillful mental activity repeated over time leads to lasting beneficial changes in neural structure or function. In other words, we have hard evidence that developing a regular, as close to daily as possible, meditative or contemplative practice, shining the attention on what we want in our life, will actually work over time to create that change. And this knowledge can be very motivating, especially for students who struggle to develop a regular practice. The following statement then lends support to the practice in Phoenix Rising of noticing what's happening in this body right here, right now. One aspect of the restorative power of internalizing beneficial experiences is that they often help you to register that in this moment you are basically all right. We ask clients to focus on what they notice in their bodies in this moment while still acknowledging past experience. What is their body experience in the present moment? So from neuroscience research, we now know that practices such as mindfulness and self-compassion can train your brain to increase and preserve your cognitive capabilities. Over the past 15 to 20 years, we've seen an alarming increase in the diagnosis of neurodegenerative diseases, as well as depression, anxiety, and difficulties concentrating. The truly good news is we now have the ability to prevent, manage, or reverse all of these problems. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Uh, here are a few resources that you might want to consider, and thank you for attending my workshop.